Good morning. Uh, this is an animation made by a student of mine at the Plantain Society. And he is making a revival of the double pica Roman of Grandjean. And actually applying uh, some of the outcomes of my research on the uh, matrices. I must honestly say it's, it's not completely correct, but it's, it's nice to view. And that's the reason that I show it to you. Um, I have to do it all a little bit in a hurry. I have 55 slides, so <laughs> let's see if I manage. Um, this is not the title of my research. So the, the title is actually... Um, Harmonics, patterns, and dynamics in formal typographic representations of the Latin script, the regularization, standardization, systematization, and unitization of Roman and italic types since the, their Renaissance origin until the Roman de Roi. The point is, most designers are not interested anymore when I uh, show this title, so uh, I made it more popular on the origin of Latin typefaces, and this seems to work actually. And hopefully, you are interested too. Uh, what I basically do, I investigate whether the proportions of type, vertically and horizontally, are, are not directly the result of handwriting, but handwriting molded on a system that was originally made for texture type. So it was introduced in Italy, there was a fixed width system, and on this system, humanistic minuscule was placed, and then we got <laughs> Roman type. So this is the, the opposite of saying there was handwriting, you put a rectangle on it, and then you have type. So I investigate uh, original material, especially at the, Plantum, the Museum Plantum Moretus in Antwerp, where I also lecture. Uh, these, this is a matrix of the Gros Canon Romain by Garamond. And I use a digital uh, microscope, which is actually made for investigating uh, computer boards. Um, this is basically the key. This is 16th or 17th century cast type. Originally, it's 16th century. This is the Moyen Canon, a Romain on top from, from Van der Keer. He was a punch cutter who worked in Antwerp. And at the bottom, you see new cast type in 1959 from the Gros Canon, which is related to the Moyen Canon. I can explain you, but that's not the right moment here. The point is, what was cast in 1959, you can see it, it has different width. And I found standardized widths in the original type. So that's the opposite of the idea they did it on the eye. No, they used a systematization for the production of type. And actually, the caster didn't need any knowledge for producing type. The information, the intelligence, the spacing intelligence was in the type itself, in the matrices. Um, measuring, of course, also with a digital caliper. What's the point? Handwriting, in handwriting you make a rhythm of strokes and you divide the white space with black strokes. In type, you divide the space with side bearings, which is something completely different. A calligrapher doesn't mind where uh, a character or the space of a character starts or ends. He just writes in a flow and a typographer at the end restores the, the system that is made by the punch cutter originally and then the type is produced by the cast. Vertically, there are no boundaries in calligraphy, as you can see here. This is 15th century humanistic uh, minuscule. This is Roman type by Janssen. This is the famous Roman, Roman type by Janssen. You recognize this. This is Gutenberg. And, um, I measured prints, and what I found out was that there was a limited system of width, only seven or eight. And um, this way they could either use fixed width molds or adjustable molds, but then with fixed registers. A register, with a register of a mold, you position the offset of the characters. And if you put the intelligence in the matrices, you have to do this once for complete lowercase or either lowercase with uppercase. Sonam and Pannerts. This is from 1472, and it looks irregular, but here you can see the same standardization. This is already in Italy, and of course, uh, I found it too in the type of Janson. A limited number of width, and actually, the system is quite simple. You can simply place simply place um, textura on a grid. It's a major grid. And is you, is you 
Anyway, the, the system is quite simple. You, you can have standardized width and um, to show the morphologic relationship between Textura and humanistic minuscule. This is Textura, and you can see here standardized width. I can easily go from the Renaissance into Textura. So I um, make the pen width larger. I decrease the A sender and D sender length, and then I condense it a bit and I flatten the curves. And I enter the Gothic type world. So it's directly related. It looks different, but it has the same uh, structure. So I applied this on the work of uh, Janson. And at the end, I found also out that they had a unit arrangement system. And this system is actually based on an M fence. So you see this rhythm throughout all the lines, also between the words. And you all recognize this type. Maybe switch to the other one. But can you switch it off? The other one? No. Let me switch off both. Just take it off. I'm not sure if it works. I will proceed in the meantime. No. Um, no? Yeah, okay. don't worry. It's a good You can introduce this and we do no. this. It's working? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Um, this is the Protomachia Polyphony. This is type made by Griffo for Aldus Manusius in 1499. And you can see the same uh, structure. Um, Griffo based his typefaces on the work of Janson. So it's not... not um, it's deliberately actually, and, and uh, Griffo used also the structures of Janson for the production. Um, what I did, I looked at the systematization, also a unitization, and this is the Gros, uh, Gros Canon Romain by Garamond, and uh, I could place it on 16 units, and in case of Janson, I could, pla could place it on 8 units. So all the characters, all the proportions, I could place on 8 units, and what is the advantage of such a system? You can easily make lines, and justification of lines is also quite simple because of these units. And Units are not very special. You are used, or familiar at least, to the units of the monotype system, which used 18 units on the M. And when you look on your computer, either a Mac or a Windows system, you will find out that the Times and Times New Roman, but also a couple of other typefaces, still are placed on this system and still show this simple rhythm. And I think this was possible to do this at monotype because the original type from the Renaissance had the system already. So type was molded in such a system. What I'm trying to do now is to apply these units into a digital version. In this case, it's Adobe also at the bottom. And see if I can reproduce the irregularities of the original type. And you can see here on top there are some combinations which are more tight and others more wide and here also with the QU. This, this is a difficult one anyway. But uh, at the bottom you can see that with spacing on eight units I come quite close. And basically you don't need have you don't need any knowledge for this. So you don't need to be a type designer. This is purely artificially applying a unit system unit system on uh, the letters. 
this is what I did. This is what I distilled and also could find uh, actually in engravings of uh, Moxon, is a mechanic exercises which he produced in the 17th century. Um, I took the distance from stem to stem. And that's not strange because when you have an amp vent, you have this rhythm of all these stems. And uh, this is the distance A, and I divided this distance into more units in case of uh, Janson, eight units, and in case of the larger type by Gardamol, 60 units. You can refine this. You can make it finer and finer, and at the bottom you will find uh, more units, and that gives you also the opportunity to make small adjustments, like here with the B on top, and here you can see it's one unit less and just a little bit tighter. On top, fence pulsing just on the rhythm of amps. At the bottom, the original uh, spacing by Robert Swimbach for Adobe, and in between, fence posting refined with 60 units and with 32 units. And you can see that in the third line, it comes very close to what Swimbach did. So this is artificially spacing, no optically corrections. Does it work also for capitals? Yes, I think so, because when you look at the type by Janson and also Minutius, you can see that the proportions of the capitals are made on the proportions of the lowercase. I looked at Janson, I distilled the system, and I made actually a table system with a refined system of units, so more units and actually leveling, so even if the typhus is not exactly made on a grid system, by leveling it, I can apply it on any typeface which is related to the type of Janson. On top, the original Adobe Janson at the bottom artificially spaced. On top, originally Adobe Garmo at the bottom artificially spaced. Bembo with cadence and factory spacing. Swift and my own documenta. How can you use it? Um, perhaps you know Chromatic, programmed by Pippin, and he applied uh, some of my theories and combined with his theories uh, in Chromatic and um, the development is supported by uh, by Dave Crossland, you know him all, and uh, it supports the table system and you can read in a table, you can read in a UFO file and it will space the type. There's a bug here, of course there's a bug with the FG. Um, so you, you need to do some corrections manually in this case, but, but in general it works very well. To show you, on top the times you run, standard spacing as it is on your Mac, at the bottom the spacing by a magic. And this is done in the split second. There are some problems here with the IJ, but you can adjust the table. It's just a table with numbers which you apply, and if you say I want to have a uh, a less tighter spacing, you can add some units somewhere, but the units are distilled from your typeface itself. So they are organic. So you are in the rhythm of your typeface when you uh, space it. This is all at the end. A very simple system. It looks at the extreme. It now looks only at the extreme on the X height and uh, on top, but at the end it will have several levels from descender to a sender, or vice versa. Very fast now, the relationship between horizontal meshes and vertical dynamics. So in this case, you can see that I marked the distance between the lines, and actually um, I found out that the M square, which Gutenberg used, was a golden section. And I applied the same system to the type of Janson and also to Garamo, and at the end I also could distill a relationship between the height of the X height, the A centers, D centers, and the capital height. And this this is a dynamic system. So you change one parameter and you can change them all. So you can put this in a type design, you make your type design more condensed, the A centers and D centers will become smaller and the capital will become smaller too. And in the other direction it's also possible. This LeBay, here it works too, a little bit different, and then you could say it's, it's a bit arbitrary, but at the end, you can always 
find this unit system behind it, and in case of LeBay, he, have, he has larger A centers and D centers and a larger B, and he used not the uh, units between uh, the stems, but he also used an M square based on the units between the stems plus the length of the serves, and the length of the serves are part of the same unit system. Van der Keren. It looks different, but it's very much related, the system behind it. So you can play with this, and at the end you can see that uh, when you make letters more condensed, like in texture, you get shorter A centers and D centers. And um, when you make your letters wider, you get larger A centers and D centers. And this is the first thing you will learn when you start designing type. What happens with an existing typeface? This is times times with the system applied, you get some longer A centers and D centers. It's a little bit more imbalanced, more elegant, and that's not strange because these proportions come from the re Renaissance. <coughs> so what is type design at the end? It's a combination of all these factors. It's a harmonic system, which you define all the, the rules for all the elements within the letters. It's a proportional system where you define the width of the characters, but all the relations, also the relationship in vertical uh, direction. Relational system is defining actually contrast and weight, and then you have the rhythmic system, which I explained. And at the end is formalization and idiom, and that's type design. So you can apply all these elements in a font program at the end, and. Uh, I showed you a letter, a letter modeler. It's a small program, programmed at uh, UW, based on my models, and we are working on it still with Dave. I'm discussing to make it open source so that others can play with it too. And it's based on, on very simple math. What can you do with it? This is another example from a student of the Planter Society. He first made the rhythm, the structure, and the weight, and the contrast. He looked at the the image, and at the end, he applied details on it. I think that's a very good way to design typeface. So you first make the structure, and then at the end, you apply the details. And you're much more versatile than if you first start designing a shape, and then look what that will it do in a word. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So we have time for two, three questions. Anyone? <laughs> yes. Your typeface model pro program, what uh, operating system does it run on? Uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux. <coughs> <laughs> uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux. It's uh, written in QT. So. No questions? Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then another hand.